Welcome to Uncomfortable Conversations about Culture and Christianity. My name is Eric, and today I'm joined by Jess. Hello, world. And Alex. Guess what? It's gonna be me. <laughs> it's it. gonna be you? <laughs> no. <laughs> May. <laughs> it's gonna be May very soon. Oh. Yeah. Have you ever that heard a, that? It's song. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Mm-hmm. I I've got heard it. it a lot. <laughs> That we, this is almost something that needs to be addressed, and maybe publicly is the best way to do it. You, Alex has this obsession with this May meme with Ju, uh, Justin Timberlake Boy bands. saying it's going to yeah. be May. Yeah. Every year, it's like, hey, how many social media posts are we going to make about it's going to be May? I'm just trying to get one out there, and this was my way of doing it. It's out there. You did it. You, you finally did it. did it. You really love that one, though. It's your favorite. It's one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, just because you can only use it like so many times. I mean, I even used it probably a day early because you, you should just use it the <laughs> day before. Oh, yeah. Right? And we're two days out right now. But Someone might be listening to there. it the day before, though. But it is going to be. Mm-hmm. It's going to be May. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad we got to know you it's a little better, Alex. Gonna Speaking gonna of gonna getting gonna to know you better, um, I was thinking. I've thought it's about gonna this. Be May. <laughs> Sorry, I've thought about this after the past our past couple podcasts because we have a lot of times people will come up to us in public in the wild and just say they really enjoy listening to us talk and getting to know us better. And I'm mm. like, that makes me think a little bit. We should ask a question to get to know you guys a little better in your day to day lives. Mm. So, what does a typical day for you look like? Like, what do you do? What time do you get Wait, up? You like, just run us, us through real quick. Our yeah. Listeners? You. Oh, our listeners. We would love you to type in your answers, though. Yeah, they're yeah. listening. Or just like, us. what does like a work day look like for you? You got to pick like, a this day. Is part, you get, like, you how about a Wednesday? A how about week? the day that we're recording? Okay, that oh, makes it so oh, Wednesday. And we just kind of know, like, hey, this is what we're doing during the day. You want me to go first? Yeah. So I usually get up, get the kids ready for school, mm. drop them off at seven forty-five. I'll work out in the morning, and then I mm. usually will go so to all camp. your kids are in school. Oh right. my! Oh, That's good a, catch. Okay. So I drop off. I drop off one to childcare, and mm. then the other two are in school. And then I um, actually go to counseling on Wednesday mornings, and then I come into work, and I'm over at City Care seeing clients. Then we do this in the afternoon, see clients mm. after that, a- even after we record. Then we'll go home. Mm. Feed the kids, put them to sleep, little Netflix, that's it. And, um, you know. Currently, what is what What are you browsing on Netflix? She's not willing to disclose. <laughs> Eric, Eric, all this, I want reality TV is what mm. I'm watching right now. And it's embarrassing. Okay. So, catch a but smuggler. S- selling Sunset. I don't know what that is. So. And the ultimatum. <laughs> so if anybody ever wants to talk about reality TV, I probably watch it. Okay. Mm. We'll, we'll leave everything else out. That's good. <laughs> All right, Eric. Oh, it's my turn? Yeah. Oh, geez. Wednesday, Wednesday, Wednesday. Okay, yeah, same thing. I get up. I don't really get my kids ready anymore. They're, you know, 11 and 12. They do it on their own. You have to wake them up at all? Uh, no, they, uh, their phones have alarms. They usually get up. Sometimes I'll, like, do an announcement on Alexa if I'm worried that it's later <laughs> and I'm not hearing them move around. But uh, take them to school. And come to work, and yeah, it just kind of depends on the week what my Wednesday morning looks like because that's like one of my open slots in the week where I can put meetings or other stuff that I need to get done. Uh, and then yeah, record the podcast, go home. Usually, my wife picks up the kids, we're an alternate family, so she I drop them off, she picks them up. And that's what it means to be an alternate family. Yeah, we're all, uh, alternating. Alternate. I meant to say alternating family <laughs> with kids pick up, not all, not alternative. Uh, yeah, then dinner and whatever whatever's going on. So no weekly like rhythm on a, in the evening. Not like Taco Tuesday and yeah. Well, I don't know watermelon Wednesdays. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Those are coming. Uh, no, not really. Not. It depends on. Sometimes there's been uh, like. Like my daughter, she has friends that, because we live in Council Bluffs and she has friends that go to a youth group that is part of her school. So she'll do that. Or my, if they're in sports or something that has practice, that means then. But it just depends. Yeah. Nice. Well, me, um, I wake up. I am not a morning person. So I struggle. 
I, I do struggle. My <clears throat> wife has all like I wake up in the morning. I use the restroom, and by then, like I okay, put that, on my watch. <laughs> I put on my watch. We, we don't need many like details. we don't need minute by minute details. <laughs> but by the time I've like <laughs> gone to the restroom, okay, there it is again. My <laughs> I put on my watch, and it's like my wife has already like run six miles, and then yeah, I already start incredible. off my day at a deficit, feeling like okay. <laughs> Way to go. It can only go up from here. And then, uh, yeah, help get the kids ready and drop off on my way to work. Two children at their elementary school, the third uh, at LifeGate. She's in preschool there. I uh, usually hope that they are out there right on time at mm-hmm. 8.50. <clears throat> Uh, at LifeGate, 156 and Dodge. Making You're really doing a lot of advertising for <laughs> Heartland Christian School in Council Bluffs. Just so I feel like I'm not advertising my kids' school. I'm not a Christian Academy. <laughs> <laughs> Make my way down to a 9 o'clock meeting, which I'm late for a lot of times oh, because no. of that 850 pickup, mm-hmm. and they're not always out there. So it wasn't an at advertisement. At least you have kids as an excuse. Yeah. And so I walk into message team typically at 9 o'clock. So we're about 10 days out on whatever sermon series we're in, and I'm pretty... I'm one of the staple people typically in message team. So that's a big deal. Yeah, it's fun. And then, um, that's 10, nine to ten thirty, And then I've got usually a block of time in there, which is usually cram time for whatever we're talking about on the podcast or yeah. listening to, you know, like maybe reading an article or asking some more questions. And then everyone knows about what happens at noon. <laughs> For noon me. ball. Noon ball. No D. Noon. Uh, noon. N O O N ball. With some friends, uh, cope, and other pastors around the the town and things like that. And then here we are. Here we are. A shower and then come to the podcast. Okay. And uh, yeah, wrap up whatever loose ends are on a Wednesday. Kind of another free block at the end of that. Head home. Dance practice for a daughter get the kids to bed shower night is Wednesday night for all our Mm. kids. So it's just a marathon of getting them in and out of the shower day and then survivor. My wife and I typically, we have that recording and survivor is typically our Wednesday night reality TV show. So Wednesdays are they're a long, it's a long day, long Mm -hmm. day. Wow. But we just love doing this in the middle of it. Mm. Perseverance. (laughs) There you go. Thank you. Thanks. You guys ever called Wednesday hump day? Nope. Well, before this gets derailed, nope. thanks for not derailing <laughs> my question. <laughs> don't do that. All right. Uh, that does it. Up next, we've got headlines. All right. Our first headline comes from NewYorkTimes.com. It says, buying Twitter, Elon Musk will face reality of his free speech talk. So this is kind of an ongoing drama for a little while as Elon Musk was kind of flirting with the idea of buying Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, what was the, And then he finally did, I guess, $44 billion. It's a lot of money. And I think there have been reactions all across the board, uh, depending on where you your, your opinion lies stands on Elon Musk, I think is kind of how people have responded to it. Are either of you still on Twitter? Is Twitter a thing that you use? I do tweet. I mean, I use Twitter daily. I don't tweet mm-hmm. daily. So yeah. I use it as an information source daily. Like, for example, today, saw some fires just driving down Dodge Street, and I'm like, instantly go to Twitter because there's the uh, Omaha scanner. Yeah. So that's where, it, so typically a lot of that check scores, mm-hmm. a lot of sports stuff for me, but uh, don't tweet as often. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm about the same. I have an account, but Big I used Jays to use fan. it a lot more. Yeah. Mm. I used to use it a lot more. Yeah. Mostly for celebrities and mm. that kind of stuff, but yeah. I feel yeah. like I that's the, one of the fastest ways to get on. information. I would say before TikTok, it was my f- favorite social media like i would i spent most of my time on twitter but tiktok is slowly creeping up on that too Um, i'm on tiktok but i there's still something about twitter that feels like you have um a direct connection to people Mm -hmm. out there whether no matter what their status is and and you like you get responses from people that you wouldn't in normal life what's your most exciting that like the best like response oh, of gosh. like, man, somebody 
actually responded to me. There was, a, I mean, this wasn't really exciting for me as much as when my son was probably about four. He would watch this YouTuber uh, named Stampy Cat, who was a Minecraft YouTuber, and he would say he would pronounce lever as lever. Oh yeah, because uh, he was British, I guess. I don't know, and. My son learned that word, and he as as uh, lever. So he would say lever all the time. And I tweeted that out to him, and I was like, "Thanks to you, my son now says pronounces lever like he's British." And he responded to me, and he's like, "Oh, we don't, we don't even. Most people don't say it that way here, even." Not. So I I just thought that was kind of random, right? Didn't really think much of it, and then probably a few months ago, I had mentioned it to my son that he had. T- responded to my tweet and he was just flabbergasted he was so he was like wait what the actual stampy cat responded to Dad, you you're so cool yeah he was just like blown awesome. away that that happened but i don't know i've i feel like sometimes you'll get like a like a you'll tweet a band or somebody like that and they'll like the tweet and you kind of feel special yeah. for a minute mm. how about you alex you ever had a oh man celebrity uh, no i mean not like a celebrity i probably Bob Goff one time I and, he, and he's got a social media team that it pretty much if you tag him he's going to like it mm. or it's I don't think it's him but there was one time a response from him mm. and uh, I'm getting emotional right now I even think about it no not really but <laughs> I know yeah, you that, love him. that was kind of cool Kathy <clears throat> Tricoli one time when we did a, <laughs> oh, a yeah. little bit of that a, was fine we did a rendition of Take Your Candle and Go Light Your World, and she responded that I lit her world. So <laughs> Wow. Yeah. I can yeah. say that. Before um, he was president, he was on Celebrity Apprentice. Oh, before and I he. Tweeted, and I, and, um, no. I'm a big reality TV. I mean, yeah. I've always like loved reality TV, and I tweeted Donald Trump, and he <laughs> tweeted me back. Really? What did yeah. he say? Um, and I don't you judge, do not now, judge I me. If... I will. Cause it just came up on my memories. It oh, was okay. like this week, this week, a couple Cause he was years in Twitter ago. jail for a while. And so Still he, is, technically. Was, okay. yeah, I was like, Hey, it would be like, I would just tweet him about the apprentice. You're fired. Mm. So that's what I like. And then I, yeah, did it a couple wow. times. Fanny so I'll have to find it. But what he said to you or anything like that. <laughs> I think it was like, thanks. Mm-hmm. I mean, it wasn't like. Yeah. a sentence but it was just like acknowledged but got, there is that, that's really it's just exci- it's like a weird exciting it's a weird thing yeah because yeah. you're like it's it it's very vain and surface level but it feels so important at the time i remember i tweeted something about uh adam sandler hosting snl one night and the saturday night live account retweeted my tweet and i yeah it like blew up then and just stuff like that. You feel connected in a way mm-hmm. that you would never yeah. feel connected mm-hmm. otherwise. G- good way of saying that. But uh, with this, I think there's a lot. And, and you mentioned Donald Trump in Twitter jail. I, I don't know where it's at. I mean, he Trump made a statement that he isn't going to come back to Twitter, even if his account is not no longer suspended. Um, I think early on with when that happened, you saw a lot of conservatives kind of leaving Twitter and Facebook for their own platforms like Parler and I think Trump has his own truth social. But when this happened, you kind of saw the reverse where a lot of people were all ang- are angry, you know, on the on the left, they were angry about this and he's going to ruin Twitter and we're going to leave and I've already seen people posting about different platforms that they're leaving to. So it's just it kind of just goes to show that it <laughs> that whatever way the wind blows, you know, people people are are going to do what they're going to do. There's a there's a quote in here uh, from Elon that said, "Free speech is the bedrock of a functioning democracy, and Twitter is a digital town square where matters vital to the future of humanity are debated." Uh, mm. And I and I saw him tweet the, when when this was announced, kind of like I pretty much saying, "I hope that my strongest critics continue to, you know." say what they will about me on here and i you know he's a billionaire i don't know what to think you know you can't you can't um i don't know it's just a tough topic to talk about because no matter what you say everything is so polarized you know from a political yeah. landscape 
and you want to believe that he's going to do good with it, but who, who's to say? I know it says in this article a decade ago, the chief executive uh, and all the executives of Twitter declared that Twitter was the free speech wing of the free speech party. Mm-hmm. And I think over the last decade, there's been more and more of that when you get an account account suspensions and then why this one versus that one, obviously there's going to be a cry um, and probably some of that valid and some of it non-valid. But I, I think for me, one of the, the toughest parts of Twitter and any social media platform is like everything would be so much more okay if like, I don't, if you had to be really you on there, cause there's so much, that's, that's one of the <laughs> venomous places like I've seen a kicker miss a field goal or whatever. Yeah. And people just attack you yeah. on there. And so there's just so many fake accounts out there. Like people just hide behind these like fake accounts. And there, uh, don't get me wrong. There's some funny fake accounts like Faux Pelini out there yeah. uh, in Nebraska land. But um, it's just, that's one of my biggest frustrations with the free speech because it's like fake free speech because you're just pretending to be someone so you can not have any consequences to your mm-hmm. actions either. So I think there's that difference right. as well. Cause just cause it's free doesn't mean it's without consequence. Yeah. And there's a cost mm-hmm. to freedom yeah. too. Yeah. And so, and we're not the best at, at, um, yeah, it, it has to be at some point, some place policed because there's threats that happen on here. There's, there's a lot of serious, mm-hmm side effects to mm-hmm. being able to tweet whatever you want to the public. So, yeah. Jack Dorsey was, I mean, the, the original creator of our co founder of Twitter. Uh, he's quoted as saying, Elon Musk is the singular solution. I trust to run Twitter, which I take that for what it, what yeah. it's worth. I, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. Cause I think out of everything that Elon Musk owns right now, this is the thing that, can touch the most people personally. Mm-hmm. So it's going to develop like a, a different way that we look at him mm-hmm. and talk about him. And if something happens on Twitter, he's going to be a part of the conversation now. And yeah. so I think it's going to give a lot more personal opinions to, cause not everybody owns a Tesla. Yeah. Well, but he was just, lots of people have Twitter accounts. And he was just in the news for are in the headlines for kind of making fun of Bill Gates weight recently. And so he just, he's had like a bad, rap for certain things he says and then other yeah it's just messy but we're you know everyone if you're still on twitter i guess we'll be along and for the he's ride he's not an american citizen is he i mean he's from south africa is that correct My, uh well i'm i'm pretty sure sh- i mean i'm pretty sure he's an american citizen but i don't i don't really know he might i don't not follow have been him a ton but i thought he was from here. originally south africa yeah i think originally uh but now that you said that uh, he's an American citizen. We have to fact check that he before is. we. Leave. He is an okay. American I was going to say, I'm pretty sure he's an American citizen. Oh, um, Penn, he got his his bachelor's at Penn. Cool. Mm-hmm. But he yeah. was South. He so he's dual, mm-hmm. a dual citizen, South yeah. African and American citizen. 2002, he became. Yeah. Well, and he was one can- of the Canada, one of the founders of PayPal. So if, uh, that was kind of where he made his fortune originally. Yeah, PayPal, Amazon. Wow. And he's got. So he's he's a member, according to this, of a citizen of South Africa, Canada, and United States. Oh, okay. Wow. Interesting. Now we know. Well, that's your Elon Musk minute, I guess. I don't know. We'll watch we'll watch it closely. You know, I'm sure we'll bring you to <laughs> to the minute updates on this as it develops. Uh, up next, we're going to be talking about why we're bad at friendships. I don't know why you guys are. But, it's hard. Uh, You've got a friend in me. <laughs> Okay, so today we're going to try to answer the question, why are we bad at friendships? Now, that may sound like a leading question, and maybe all of us at this table wouldn't necessarily agree that we're bad at friendships. Uh, But even more specifically, are Christians uniquely worse at friendships than non-Christians? Or are they better? Or are they better? Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, we're going to try to answer some of those questions see what maybe some of the hurdles are road roadblocks i mean before we dive in completely do you where do where do we at this table feel do we feel like we're good at friendships bad at friendships thoughts when okay so when you first 
pitched this idea, mm-hmm. I instantly I got a little defensive. I yeah. think like even even like hearing the thought about that, and I think a lot of us would that are listening, because my first inclination was I'm good at friendships. Like yeah. I care about the people that are in my life, and I feel like I'm doing a good job. But then I also thought it's really an area that I that just flows for me and Mm -hmm. it flows very naturally. And I don't really stop and think a lot about my rhythms and just examine kind of some of the things that we're going to talk about today. Mm -hmm. So I think in that respect, like I kind of had to take a step back and kind of check, do like a humility check because I think instantly the prideful part of me was like, I'm good at friendships. Like why do we even need to talk about this or why do I need to kind of look inward? And so for me, this was kind of, I took this as just a way to like look yeah. inward for us to just have a, a genuine conversation around it. Cause I do think that there's struggles and from my non-Christian friends, even there are biases towards like how Christians act and mm-hmm. feeling like projects and things like that. So hmm. I feel like, I try to be super aware. I feel like my friend group is, I don't, I don't know if we do. I, it doesn't feel right to put my friends in, in percentages, but I think that like, I have quite a few friends. Who's your best friend? Just (laughs) put it out there right now. (laughs) I'm saying, I don't want to do like, Oh, 25% of my friends are non-Christians and 75% aren't like that just seems to devalue friendship to me. I don't know. There's something in that that just feels gross, but I, I feel like I have a healthy mix. I'll say that of just. So you would f- say you wouldn't agree that you're bad at friendship. I like so. to think I'm not a, a bad friend, but yeah. I also want to be yeah. sensitive no, to that. Good. Like I want to take a look at it. So that's kind of where I feel. And I, and part of this, you know, spurs from, I mean, just studies showing that friendship is at an all-time low and I yeah. mean, the pandemic kind of worse than that people were further apart from each other uh, but alex how do you how do you feel you rate in the friendship department are you a pretty good friend or are you i think i don't i don't know if there's anybody you'd ask that said, thinks they're a bad friend uh-huh. so yeah. i think i'm i mean i i would like to are think you good I'm, i guess it's uh, more about being a, a are you bad at that relationship of like friendship Friendship. yeah yeah (laughs) not that you're a bad person or something no i yeah yeah i don't know i i think i'm good friend i hope i am i have i would i have some people i would consider really good friends but it just seems like it's one of those conversations that it's uh there's ripples to it or Mm -hmm. you know pockets of people where Mm -hmm. there's like circles of intimacy i don't know what you want to call it where there that gets mm-hmm. wider and wider and what you share with those people kind of like our yeah. logo back here it you know it's tighter mm-hmm. and then gets more and more broad and my affection mutual affection towards people can you know i, I have a limit to like the depth of friendship and how many people i can hold mm-hmm. into that yeah. but i also want to think i have the capacity to, to have a very large friend base as well, but knowing the limits of what that means Mm -hmm. with like a close friend, tight Mm -hmm. friends, and then also like, and then you got social media, things like this, obviously that play a part of what Mm -hmm. is friendship, what is friendship actually look like, especially when you have Facebook Mm -hmm. is like friends and it's not followers and you know, things like that. Or it should be more like acquaintance book. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, because I do think there's a difference between friends and acquaintances, mm-hmm. uh, people that are even coworkers, some to certain extent. So you might have a decent relationship with a coworker, but not be good friends. Is it just you are in the counseling field? Are you noticing like with as a need for counseling rises? Is that because people are desperate to find someone to talk to mm-hmm. because they don't have those relationships with? other people or is it different is it more complicated than i think it's a a little more complicated but i'm glad you asked that because um in in my first intakes of like meeting somebody that's one of the first things i ask is like who is in your like who's your social circle Mm -hmm. but like who do you have a best friend yeah i know that's weird to ask but it's just it always is a leading question because it opens up a lot like Mm -hmm. what is a best friend and who's close i think that with COVID, I think that's what's kind of pushed our mental health. Yeah. Uh, th- the rates of like people being in counseling and in therapy and why we're just all booked because I think that it, it 
highlighted a lot of mental health issues. But I also think that there were a lot of friends. Like I had friends that were at a place where they had never gotten counseling. And I was as a close friend able to speak into that mm-hmm. of like, Hey, this is probably a good time to work, to work on this. And so I think to that extent that, um, that's one thing I'm seeing. And then there's this other part where I think it's the, the gen, the gen X and what is it? Gen Y, Gen Z, Gen Z, it's Gen Z and then the millennials. Mm -hmm. I think that we have, our culture is so busy, 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 go, go, go that we don't even take time for friendship. So like one thing that I've like really been trying to be intentional about for myself is to simplify more and to like, it's hard to make new friendships when I think we neglect some of our good friendships that we have that we really could be pouring into. So sometimes I think there's this battle between us of, I want to care about people and have people in my circle. But then also the reality is I'm neglecting people that are really close to me. And so I think sometimes it's just like, I try to, I'm trying to be a good friend. I think that's what a lot of us would say. Like, I'm trying to be a good friend. I feel like I could do more. I think it's a place mm-hmm. where we can like really sit in some guilt too. Yeah. But I think it's mm-hmm. both and we we're just full and the our culture expects us to be full of all this stuff and then it's just like, well, where does friendship fit in? Like for us, I think it would be do I want to go out with friends or like see my family today? Mm-hmm. I mean, we kind of are having to choose between a lot of things, which makes this hard, right? Yeah. So then it's just mm-hmm. like, are we bad at friendships? I think I'm a good friend, but I think yeah, sometimes I am bad at friendships. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, let, I mean, we, we kind of hit on it, but why do you think friendships are important in general? Is it is it just the human connection? Is it is it something more than that? I mean, Since I think we were, feel isolated? we were built for community. And so, like, I think at the core of who we are, we are people that were made in the image of God. And part of what it means to be made in the image of God is that God is a communal, eternal being. And so you've got Father, Son, Holy Spirit uh, that, you know, are eternally in community and not isolated from one another. And so uh, not to get in a whole tangent of that, but so I think part of what it means to be made in the image of God is to be somebody that is made to desire affection and mm-hmm. a person made to to give affection or to to give friendship so a person that is is designed to be needed and to need from others and so i think that's a that's why it's so important and if we're isolated then uh it pushes us away from i think what it means to be an image bearer of of Jesus, but then we're all wired uniquely, I think for how much we can handle, Mm -hmm. like what capacity we can handle in different stages of life and, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, there's ebbs and flows of that for sure. Well, and you mentioned social media and how it's kind of degraded the perceptions of what friendship is. I mean, even MySpace, we had our top eight and then (laughs) Facebook. Now we have, (laughs) you know, thousands of friends, but are those friends, you know, close friends or just people that we connected with on Facebook. Yeah. And so maybe people think they have a lot of friends, but, um, I think even for us and like this in today's, we, we talked about it on Twitter and you have that unique access to, to people and mm-hmm. people with influence. Like there's, you know, conversations that people will come up to me and they know me, like they feel like they know me because of this podcast or because they've seen me preach or, you know, whatever. And which is, which is great. I mean, I'm grateful for it. But then at the same time, I like, I feel like put off and this is awkward for me because I feel bad that I don't know. I don't reciprocate that back to you. We even had, you know, a listener talk about for Lent, they took off, you know, listening to podcasts for a part of Lent and they reached out to us and, and it was meaningful to get you know, an email saying, Hey, like I listened to a lot of podcasts. And so because of that, I took that off for Lent and like, I missed you guys. Mm -hmm. And so like, there's a meaningful part Mm -hmm. of that, that hearing about our lives and the conversations weekly are good. And, and this person talks to us, I think a lot and does give a lot of feedback, but it's just that weird space that we're in where you, you can watch a movie almost sometimes and feel like you have a connection with a a totally fake Mm -hmm person that's out there and so is that a friendship well because I, I think like for you 
like you might not feel like the genuine feeling of friendship from from them, but like, what if somebody else is getting what we're talking about? Yeah, from social media, like it really does. Okay, so maybe it's not like an equal friendship, but there's like this feeling of community mm-hmm. that we can give people, and I think that's what I think that that is what we give people through doing this on social media. But it doesn't. It feels different not having that connection. Yeah, but I think like you hear stories all the time. I I even saw on TikTok like this wife like reunited two guys that have been playing like Call of Duty on, is it on Xbox? It could be anywhere. I don't know. But they'd been playing for Game like Boy. 10 years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> for like 10 years. Yeah. And they finally met. But that, was that not a genuine friendship because they had never yeah. met? Hmm. Like we, I don't know. We can, we can really connect with people. Well, and part of the reason we're talking about this is Kerry Newhoff. He's yeah. a Canadian pastor who posted a blog called Three Things Christians Do That Non-Christians Despise. And the first two were kind of obvious. Judge, like we, we you, you'd be prepared for that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, two was be hypocritical. Okay, yeah, you, you'd expect that. But the third one was stink at friendship. And that one, it stood out to me because I'm like, okay, that's something I don't, here so why why is that that maybe a non-christian would perceive uh christians as being bad at friendship and i thought maybe maybe it has to do with social circles like we're less maybe a little less likely to hang out in the same places or you know potluck versus the bar i don't know you know like what what are what are these perceptions that that people have um and one of those questions is you know do we do you think that we tend to lessen the value of deep friendships because we are we have this more desire and feeling that we have to be about our father's business so we're you know more connected into what we're doing as a christian than what we're doing as connected to one another i don't know is that something that you think is sometimes not that that's not that either of those things are bad things by themselves, but is it sometimes hard for a Christian to prioritize their lives and the, who they're investing in and the time they're investing in because of that? Even when you're talking, I think that there's a difference between like us genuinely um, going after going after friendship and pers- like pursuing friendship with someone. And then I think where we get tripped up is something that you said made me think of the things we think we should be doing. Mm-hmm. So it's like, I genuinely connect with this person over weightlifting or like, I really like talking to my neighbor about this or that. And like, we're buddies. Mm-hmm. But then I think we get tripped up when it's like, Oh, I should, I should be trying to convert them or I should be trying to do this. And I think that's where, there's a, a hang up in there mm-hmm. of where we get caught up. And I think that that has a lot to do with it. That would be for me. What do you think? Yeah. I, I, for me, I think one of the struggles that I've noticed about, I guess my own self, and I think it comes from a, you know, a Christian heart and motivation of, you know, salvation and, eternal judgment and, you know, those things that I want people to, like, I, I, it's easy for me to say, well, part of what being a good friend is, is getting people to love God. Like Mm -hmm. that's, that's my mission and getting people to love God is part of what it it means to be a good friend. And, and one of the things, even a, you know, realization I've had this week thinking about this and, and sermon prep is what if I spent more of my time getting people to know God loves them than getting them to try to love, convincing them that God loves them no matter what, rather than convincing them that they need to love God. Mm. And so I think so much of our maybe relationships, I think of as a parent or siblings or people that I know that don't love God, like my mode of operation. And it's because I want to get people to like me too. And so I lead sometimes in friendships, getting people to like me instead of getting people to know I like them. And mm-hmm. so that's when I think those motivations can kind of get backward. And, and so I think there's a tendency, you know, from a Christian worldview that we really do care genuinely for people. And we think 
I need to send out a life raft. That person's drowning and that's what it means to be caring. And what friendship means is to see them out there, Mm -hmm. you know, floundering and to throw them a life preserver. And so we, I think we, we have a savior complex sometimes where, where we want to be the person that helps save everybody Yeah, because we're called to, and there is that, there's that seriousness that we see in that worldview. And so that's where it can become difficult is how do we balance that in friendships for sure. Mm -hmm. Cause I do think that the Christians who are, have very deep relationships with non-Christians is probably fairly rare and, you know, vice versa. Like it's, I'm, I wouldn't say it's unheard of, but I do think that's probably more rare in our communities. Uh, And, I think when you look in, in the Bible, you see Jesus exemplifying relationships with what they would have considered non-believers and making the religious people upset because of who he was hanging out with. And mm-hmm. uh, I do think there is a tendency with because of evangelism for non-believers to feel like Christians are making them their their projects. We mentioned that earlier, but it's like, okay, you're you're my project. I need to save you. And even in like a dating relationship or something like that, that's never, it's a good, it's a good intentions to have and it's your heart's in the right place. But if it it almost devalues the relationship, if they feel like you're just trying to, without, without them understanding who God is, you coming at it from that angle of, Oh, I'm just trying to convert you just seems very superficial to them. Not that that is a superficial thing on your part, but if that's, if that, if they feel like that's your only motive for being their friend, then it's it's hard for them to see it any other way, at least maybe in the beginning, I think. Mm-hmm. And I think ultimately that deep friendships, it, it it is difficult, I think, to have a deep, meaningful friendship with a lot of fruit that's being born if if the most significant things about you are just different. You mm-hmm. know, if you're, whether that's your morals or, you know, even how you see race or what all of those things, these big parts of what, what it means to be human and the things that I'm passionate about. If, you know, you have someone that's a friend that mocks God or what, you know, mocks the things that you do and they just think it's, it's silly. Then I think that's hard to like continue to be in relationship, Mm -hmm. you know, with that type of person that would, that I think we would say is the antithesis of what a Christian is, but that doesn't mean, you know, somebody that just doesn't know or is questioning things that's different than like someone that's fully atheist. It's hard for those yeah. two things to get a, people to get along. I, I think, think there's, there's, there's relationships that kind of mutual, uh, mutual. Um, yeah. Mutual respect yeah. for, for each sure, other's yeah. beliefs. You know, mm-hmm. it's not like, okay, I'm going to make fun of you because you believe this. It's just, I believe differently. Yeah, for sure. And at, some point that's every christian friendship that i have too Mm -hmm. you know and so there's there's things that i well and i different one one thing i saw after we we'd already discussed this and i i think i was scrolling through tiktok last night and i saw um a woman on there who was had deconstructed or whatever and the reason that led her to deconstruct and actually you know further than deconstruct she left the faith and her argument was that she had a friend who was an atheist and that friend asked her, so the God that you believe in, you believe he's going to send me to hell then. Right. And that was her moment uh, where she, she couldn't kind of reconcile that. And she's like, well, no, I don't, God's going to send bad people to hell. You're not a bad person. But then that's any, and you see that kind of the shallowness of maybe what she believed kind of start to break down, you know? And I think that, that's that's a messy place that we put you know we, we when we don't like we don't fully think out the way our actions are perceived by other people sometimes mm-hmm. and you know it's it's a hard thing it's a, it is a hard thing to reconcile you know and i i think that we're called to love people and and how do you you know how do you yeah how do you love someone when you believe that you know it's really tough well and i also don't think that we're saying the antithesis of christianity is you know how many people am i going to convert in my lifetime and this is the life Mm -hmm. style that i need to lead to do that and i don't think the antithesis of a non-christian is sitting here bashing jesus and questioning who he is like i think that there are some people that would do that but i think that there is a lot more um, middle and common ground i think there's 
a lot more people that I meet, I, I have a healthy mix of, if we're saying like believers, non-believers like that are, that I'm in friendship with. And I think a lot more is, is common ground of maybe being more spiritual than religious. Like I think that yeah. they're identifying a little bit differently. Um, but something that I think a lot of times in my friendships and it's, that's really kind of helped me, um, in my journey of, cause there was a time where it's like, I think being raised, especially like I was raised in a very legalistic church where it was like, mm-hmm. this is kind of what you do. This is what you don't do. And so for me, it was kind of a struggle of, okay, well I can only be friends with other people that believe and think like me. Mm-hmm. And I think that that for me, if I hadn't checked myself, would have carried into a lot of different things, you know? Um, but there was a point in my life and it was sometime in college where it was like, looking at the scripture and looking at Jesus and it being pointed out to me that when Jesus met people, he did not address their physical, he didn't address their spiritual needs first. He addressed their physical needs. He fed the 5,000 and then he talked to them. Yeah. And so it's like, how can I live like that? How can I care about like, Hey, you just had a baby. Let me bring you a meal versus, Mm -hmm. Hey, you just had a baby. Let's like get that baby saved and, baptized or whatever we think mm-hmm. should dedicated, whatever we think should happen. Um, and so I think it's good to kind of look at it. And then also, you know, what boundaries do you have? Like, can you have friendships like that? I don't think we're saying mm-hmm. you have to be exactly like us. Yeah. I, yeah. It's, it's, it's tough. I think that I've witnessed a lot of even just, just growing up, in a church environment and seeing family members who have struggled to have fulfilling relationships, even, even with Christians who are maybe like newer Christians and maybe they've stumbled or made, made a mistake. And then they've, be, they've used that to be very judgmental and, mm-hmm. and almost, and I've even seen that where they've bra- broken off friendships because of a mistake or something like that. And I think that's, that's definitely not what we're suggesting. Yeah. All of them yeah. are like, but I do th- I think uh, as a perception of a non-Christian is going to think maybe this is what my relationship with a Christian mm-hmm. is going to be like mm-hmm. that can happen. Yeah. And I think there's, there's scripture that people take to extremes. Um, you know, I think one of them is do not be unequally yoked and what fellowship should light have with darkness. And I think there's some Christians that are like, they do whatever they can to avoid, you know, maybe those that don't know Jesus like the plague you know, especially mm-hmm. in deep relationships because they think, you know, what Paul's getting at there is that they, they just can't be, they can't coexist together. And the reality is that what darkness and light can't have fellowship together because light is light overcomes that ultimately. Mm-hmm. And so that's what Paul I think is getting more at with, with that passage. But, and then there's, you know, scripture that talks about like iron sharpening iron. That's like a famous, you know, a famous bro verse. I think a lot, (laughs) not that it's only used for that, but like a lot of gyms, I feel like, yeah, iron sharpens iron and we'll have our men's huddle and it's iron, iron hero, CrossFit or something like that. That's where Jess goes, right? (laughs) Um, Anyway. Uh, So I think there's some of those passages that inform what friendship looks like. And then we do see Jesus like, with those layers of friendship, even within his disciples, he's got, you know, three, uh, that are, that are pretty close to him. And then there's, you know, that he has more of a relationship. They even argue about John and Peter are always like found arguing about, I got to the tomb first, or I'm the one you love the most Mm -hmm. and and things like that. But then it does seem like he has a, a deeper developed relationship with those, those guys. And then outside of that, there's the 12 disciples. And then outside of that, there's more like he'll go make friends with, with non-Christians with quote unquote sinners, you know, Nicodemus and he meets with him and he has questions and Matthew, who was originally a tax collector, who he ended up calling to him. And so we see Jesus start these relationships with, with people that don't know him or haven't decided to follow him yet at that point. And so, Mm -hmm. uh, but there is like a, an, a deeper level of intimacy as well that he's having with, with some people um, that he's, you know, projecting them to go and do likewise as well. Yeah. So how do we, I mean, do you feel that you struggle to find or make friendships with even people different than yourself, whether it's 
race, religion, political view, sexuality, is that something, I mean, I think you kind of hit on it earlier, Alex, that it is, it is more difficult to make a, have a deep relationship with someone who maybe has a completely different worldview than you and you don't have anything in common. Uh, but are there other, other things that you think are barriers in the way, whether it's in like even something more like political view is that, is it challenging to be friends with someone who thinks different than you politically? And I mean, I don't know there's like, I've had friendships where maybe my views politically have changed from my friends. And then that made that they made a, there was a tension that formed in that friendship because of that. And it, it's, it's one of those things that's a, it's a hurdle to get over, but it's probably worth pursuing. Yeah. I think if value, if a relationship, like if every time I'm together with somebody, there's like abrasive conversation, like mm-hmm. that is the thing that they always lead with. Yeah. And it seems like, Hey, they value where we're different more than where we're alike, you know, then I think it becomes increasingly difficult to be friends when you're like, man, I just want to hang out with you. Cause we both like basketball or yeah. I like, I be- genuinely have a good time with you when we talk about this thing. But then when you always are not even questioning or we're talking, we're having discussion, but it's like, you're becoming abrasive about mm. where we are different. And most of the time is spent on the things that, that are in commonalities versus commonalities. Then it does become like, I'm having to put in work all the time to, to defend. And that doesn't feel like, you know, f- friendship and unity and, right. you know, g- good stuff happening. And so I have had friendships that like, have gone that way, you know, because of maybe they've jumped into politics or they've heard something about me or they assume and I assume or whatever, either way it can happen. And it does become, I think, more and more difficult to to continue those friendships uh, when that's the crux of what a relationship yeah. becomes about rather than the commonality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think you you said something about values and I think that that's more where mine would line up to. It's not necessarily political or what do we say? Sexual. I mean, those things to me are details, but it's like, what are your values and like, what, how do I see you living? And yeah. And it's like, what are you believing to me? It's, it's kind of like a test of capacity. So it's like, if I have a friend that like only wants to talk about basketball, I'm probably only going to go to basketball games with that person and like have an awesome conversation with them and like really enjoy that because I enjoy that, but it's probably not going to be farther than that. And so to me, that's a gauge of where that friendship is. It's probably an out, like you talked about earlier, it's like an outer ring friendship. They don't have to have all access and you don't have to give in a friendship all access to somebody to have a genuine friendship. So I think that there's like gauges that as we meet people and look at them and like, Hey, what, what do we connect on? That doesn't mean you bring them instantly into your inner circle, but Mm. I don't know why we can't just, you know, be friends with somebody because they like basketball. It's not like we have to, I don't know. I think mutual care is a part of friendship too. Yeah. And so like, I would hope like that I have, what would be considered in at some level of friendship with all of my neighbors around me that we're not and it. Like, so I think there's like friends, which seem like, Hey, this is, we're, we're in this together. We work together. We sacrifice for one another. And that's a part of, I think what friendship means. And then there's enemies, you know, and that's the opposite of that. Mm-hmm. And I would hope that at some level I have some kind of friendship, some kind of common outside of we're just human, but some kind of common ground that I'm finding with each one of my neighbors to figure out, Hey, like it's not awkward for you to come and ask for a cup Mm -hmm. of sugar. And I don't feel awkward to go and ask you for, you know, an egg or whatever. So I would hope, you know, and some of that's dependent on it. Hey, you just move here and you live here and you don't get to pick your neighbors all the time or, or family or whatever. But I hope there's this, this Mm. genuine sense of, Hey, we care about one another's basic needs and humanity. Mm. And man, if they got in a car accident or whatever, I wouldn't hesitate to go mow their lawn or vice versa. Like I would hope that because of the proximity, I at least have relationships no matter what, with all those people that are formed that Mm. we would call Mm -hmm. a friendship. And, and that's, that's a hope, but, are, am I texting them all the time? No. And so yeah. I think there's, there, it just gets complex of how we define what a friend is too, I think. And I think also just for me being totally honest, I don't have the gift of evangelism. 
So Mm -hmm. it's like, I'm well aware of that. Like Alex, you could have, I mean, Alex is who I send people that I, that I don't necessarily know questions. Like I'm like, here, email this guy or go call Mm -hmm. the church. Or I think Mark has the gift of evangelism. And so that's something where it's like, I'm aware that that's not my gift. And so I'm not going to be as well put together or eloquent with that. And that's not a shame thing for me, but it's a, it's just something that I know about myself, but it's like, you know, I can buy Gatorade for my neighbors that are sick at target. And I think that that, that, that kind of stuff like can send the same message. And I have to believe that our God that is so unique and how he per has pursued us each personally, um, that he, we're not that important. Like mm-hmm. it's not, I'm not that important that if I'm, if I miss something in and knowing that like, I'm going to stumble over evangelism, but I'm still c- trying and showing like, the different traits of the Lord that that isn't still able to send a message. And so I think that it's not something that we just like ignore and give up and say, well, I don't have this gift. Like I'm not going to put Jesus into how I'm pursuing this person, but I think it's part of who we are. And I know that that can sound kind of like liberal and like, Oh, Jess is just saying like whatever, but it's like, but think about how God pursued you. And think about the people that have shown Jesus to you without saying anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think in the church communities, there's always kind of an emphasis on getting married, starting a family. Like that's very important mm-hmm. uh, to the young Christians. And I wonder if sometimes that doesn't always leave space for us to know what un- just a f- good deep friendship is like with mm-hmm. people. Uh, because I would say that, probably my closest friendship I have is with my spouse. And I I would assume that would be a common thread at this table. And with our spouses. Yeah. Not with my spouse. (laughs) Yeah. You're in each (laughs) respective uh, spouses. Way to clarify Alex. Um, Thank you. But is it, is it, is it healthy? Is it good to have confidants that are not your spouse that you can tell deep intimate things too, and share those those fears and those things that maybe you or maybe even vent about your spouse too or I mean there's there's certain things that might be helpful and healthy about that but I don't know if it's always prioritized as well because we just don't have the time to maintain mm-hmm. so many relationships yeah I think the depth of or even what we're talking about as far as friendship is is very shallow compared to a lot of times how it was set up in scripture. There's a book called Spiritual Friendship, which I read and it really changed a lot of my perspective or not my perspective, but it it highlights throughout church history and throughout scripture where friendship covenants were just, were made um, much more often. And they looked a lot like what we would say is a marriage covenant. Uh, But these were people that were committed to families and they were committed to like their families doing life together. They were like chosen families as they would move and and they would be put in exile and all these things. And so there was very real room for covenants between friends of people that you would do anything for. No greater love has any man than this, that he would lay down his life for a friend is one of the things that Jesus, you know, talks about. And so I think we have to realize in scripture and in church history that friendship has been one of the premier things going back to, that God wired us for relationships and then easily we turn it into like intimacy and sex and all that kind of stuff. When, when you fold in like a, a partner or a spouse mm-hmm. uh, into to that, and then we forget that, Hey, this has been a big part of what it means to be human. I mean, some of the biggest, I mean, Jesus, we, we didn't, we don't think had a spouse, you know, Paul, who is one of the, you know, biggest, you know, people that wrote the the New Testament had deep friendships with a lot of people in these different places as he's spreading the gospel that he had covenantal ties to, uh, I think that were a, a very big deal. And so it does get muddy when we overemphasize, I think, uh, a marriage relationship with just God given and a blessing. But Paul also says not being married is a blessing too. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes we highlight one of those blessings over the other instead of realizing the blessing and the gift that God has called us to and how we steward that blessing. And so I think that's a, that's a, that's a big part of it. We're called all of us 
as spouses to steward that relationship, but I think others as well. So mm-hmm. that's well said. Yeah. Read, Read the Je- book. I can Read see Jess book. is like <laughs> marinating on something over there, but I'm not sure if, if I'm you're- thinking about how, um, just how our, like we would say like each of our spouses is close to us. And to me that kind of also reflects like who's in my inner, inner circle. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, my inner circle hasn't changed. It's been like the same four people for years and years. Yeah. Um, but I would, but like thinking about that, I would not, it kind of, it kind of helps me like when I have boundaries for friendships. So it's like, I'm not going to have, this is just for me. I'm not going to have somebody in my inner circle that like thinks like pornography and that kind of stuff. Like in marriage is okay. That's like, just like a, random fact for me. So it's like, I'm not going to have somebody that's like, if we're talking about Ben and then my next closest friendships that I think like can be, they're also the people that you choose to let influence you. It's Mm -hmm. also like your community that you choose to, and they choose to support you and you choose to support them, but it's a huge influence. So I just think of those two are very, are closely obviously combined, but they're also different. I mean, like each of our spouses, it's like this, it's a different Mm. phase of intimacy than you have with a close friendship. Well, I, I mean, so I'm from Omaha and most of my life has, has been in Omaha. And so a lot of my best friends, childhood friends are still here. And I have those relationships. I remember one of the the toughest parts of my marriage was my wife is not from Omaha. And so the, the, the Mm. friends that, Mm -hmm. that she moved away from a lot of her best friends who live in a small town and a lot of them still live there together. And, and I remember like, I want my wife, like I love my wife, but I want my wife to have friends that she can just go hang out with. Not just like talk Mm -hmm. to via text message and all that. She's still friends with them. And it doesn't say that those friendships aren't valuable, but I wanted for my wife friends that she could go do things with outside of me that she could enjoy. Cause Mm -hmm. it takes, it's just valuable. And so mm-hmm. for it, it took a while to build those relationships, obviously, because I'm starting from my whole life's foundation has been built here. And now she's building a foundation here. But now her having very healthy friendships mm-hmm. uh, with some gals that, that she you know does a lot of life together and, and all of that, it helps our marriage as well because it takes yeah. the burden of carrying all of the relational capacity that she needs to be cared for off of me. And I don't have to be this savior, but it's a community of people that is shaping her, is forming her, is helping point her to Jesus. And that's not all falling on me. And so I know for me that I want that. Like I, I don't want to be like a singular best friend right. with somebody because we all need uh, to be sharpened in other types of ways as well. So like terms like you're my best friend. I mean, I, I get it, but at the same time, like, man, we should have, you know, people in our lives outside of just one person that we're relying and putting all of this pressure mm-hmm. on because that's also not a healthy friendship yeah. either. Yeah. And it gets yeah. overwhelming. I mean, that's a lot of pressure to be one person's one person. Right. And I don't, I've never seen that work out in a healthy way. Yeah. Usually like if somebody's trying to force you to only be the, the only person they're in a relationship with, it, it becomes manipulative. It's, it's grounds for abuse to start happening yeah. for a lot yeah. of, uh, a lot of dangerous things when somebody tries mm-hmm. to isolate you and, and almost control that relationship. I, I don't think it's healthy, you know, and, and mm-hmm. so even we see that model in God, there's three, you know, the, the Godhead is, is three father, son, and Holy spirit. And so I think even, you having all of your dependence on one person is is not a healthy uh, place to be in as far as friendship either. Yeah, I also think there's this element of like having some social awareness of mm-hmm. friendships too. Because I think a lot of times when we're feeling pushy or like we should be doing something or pursuing something, we need also need to look at just like our social awareness of, okay, am I offending this person? with my, I have this agenda or something I'm feeling convicted to do, but how is this making the other person feel? Like yeah. what's their body language? Are they having a conversation? Are they engaged? I mean, that's a good, um, yeah. I think way to look at relationships too. Or a, a social awareness to know when you're not the friend that you think you yeah. are too. Like, <laughs> or you're going too far. I think yeah. sometimes we just kind of go off on, on tangents and we don't realize I think it's just valuable so, to be able to have someone that you can share things with that you wouldn't 
probably talk totally. to other people about. Mm -hmm. But building that trust is is really difficult. And I wonder if if sometimes we, you know, we don't really know how deep our relationships are because they're ours, you know, and so you don't you don't know how to compare it. So maybe hearing, oh, you, wait, you have a friend that you talk about that X, Y, Z with? Oh my goodness, I don't talk to anybody about that, you know? So it's mm -hmm. just sometimes people maybe don't have an awareness of of what a healthy friendship can be or should be or is or can't, you know, it, there's probably no definition that we're going to put on it today that's going to say this is yeah. perfect friendship, but everybody needs a friend. Well, you want to sing You've a song got again? a friend in me. I was me. waiting for that. I was kind of, yeah. We always love it when you sing. You got a friend in me. Um, and the road gets rough ahead and you're miles Okay. And miles all right. All right. No more singing. Oh, uh, that's good. Thanks. Um, yeah. I remember what your old pal said. We'll, we'll try to, we'll try to do that. I, I think we can all probably be more intentional about forming meaningful and long lasting friendships yeah. in some ways, because it, it, it is a challenge and I think we can get caught up in life in general and not realize how important that is to to maintain those relationships but well i think we just know that's a huge part of our spiritual growth it's a part of spiritual maturity it's why we talk all the time at christ community about a community being our middle name we were just designed for it we do better when we are in community our needs are met we help meet other people's needs like it it's you know, scripture talks about mm -hmm. a body, you know, having many different parts. It, it's just so foundational of what it means to be human that we just, whether we call it friendship or whatever you want to call it, community yeah. is so vital uh, and it's a need that we all have. Uh, and it's a yep. it need both ways. We need yeah. to be a friend and we need to be befriended. So I think we go back to the beginning. Why are we bad at friendships or are we bad at friendships? Mm -hmm. I think that's a good self-reflective question to ask. Mm -hmm. I think we've kind of like d dove into that a little bit, like personally for us, but I think there's a lot that comes at us in these areas. It's like, we're busy, mm -hmm. we're struggling, we're learning, we're maturing. We're trying to meet new people and feel this pressure and trying to figure out where Jesus meets mm -hmm. the things in our life in so many different ways. And so I think, and I, look at it. And I think there's just some there's some practical telltale signs too. If you go to someone with good news, they should be excited for you. They shouldn't be jealous. I think if you go to someone with bad news, they shouldn't try to tell you a worse story that happened to them right away. They should listen to you and 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 be compassionate. I mean, there's just there's some telltale signs of a good friendship, and there's those the in reverse the and signs you of being a, bad, a good friend, a bad yeah. friend. you not sure. one upping. Yeah, and I think that's just, and I think sometimes we think, oh, I'm such a good friend, but uh, let's, I rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Yeah, yeah, right. So just take the time, maybe self-examine a little bit, and say, you know, are my friendships as strong as I think they are? And that's just something to, because I do think this is one of those topics, and we've had these topics a lot on this podcast where people. Are like, ah, what are you? Why are you talking about this? Yeah. Get anywhere? Yeah, is, this, is this important? Is this this isn't for me? Or, and I do think it's something that we can all self evaluate and on. grow. Yeah, mm -hmm, for sure. And ask questions. I mean, if you think you're a good friend, if you can't ask that question to your friends, then yeah, uh, there's definitely ways that you have mm -hmm. blind spots that you could approve on in any kind of friendship, right? Marriage, best friend forever, whatever it is. So yeah. Well, if you have any uh, thoughts or concerns you'd like to send to us, who are, I mean, your internet best friends here on the Uncomfortable Podcast, uh, you could do so by reaching out to us on social media at CCC Omaha, or you can send us an email to podcast at cccomaha.org. And until next time, we'll talk to you then. <laughs>